On December 7, 1941, Japan, like its infamous Axis partners, struck first and declared war afterwards. On the fateful day Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, the 2,400 dying at the unfortunate naval base weren't the only American victims of Japan's shocking operation. It was a pan-Pacific all-out attack to take out U.S. territories in the Pacific Ocean. Japan didn't annex Hawaii, but it invaded and captured the U.S. territories of Guam and the Philippines, the British territories of Hong Kong, Singapore, and Malaya, as well as the independent kingdom of Siam, now Thailand. The attack of Bataan in the Philippines was America's largest military defeat during the Second World War, forcing tens of thousands of American and Filipino soldiers to surrender. On 15th February, units of the 7th Fleet open up a 90-minute barrage on the southern tip of Bataan in preparation for landing elements of the 38th Division at Marivelas Harbor. While a majority of these POWs joined the other POWs captured in the Asia-Pacific for the infamous Bataan Death March, those who weren't sent to the prison camps were herded into merchant ships for a journey that would make Dante's Inferno look tame. Welcome to Nutty History. In this video, we're going to explore the diabolic journey undertaken by prisoners of war on Japanese hell ships. A Journey Through Hell We are certain that at least 70,000 Allied prisoners of war and conscripted laborers were transported to Japanese merchant ships starting their journey from the Philippines. These ships then traveled to mainland China, Korea, and finally Japan on 156 voyages. Some of the 134 ships would occasionally take up to a month or even more for the journey. These ships were stuffed with prisoners like overcrowded chicken cages and a third world poultry supply wagon. If anybody dared to break out to the deck, guards on top would be waiting for them with arms. The Japanese guards would cram the prisoners every night in these small enclosed areas like packed sardines. The holes were filthy with coal dust, congealed sugar syrup, and horse manure left over from previous voyages these merchant ships had undertaken. These holes were pitch dark and unbearably hot. The guards would not even separate the sick. They would allow the sickness to fester and spread through the prisoners. Life on Hell Ships Though starving the POWs as much as possible was the norm, the Japanese guards would often provide some food to the prisoners on the ships. Mostly, it was a cold soup made out of the tops of potato plants that would look like a sick green concoction and hardly had any nourishment. A soldier wrote in his memoirs that you could chew the chunks in it for months and still wouldn't be able to break it down. This potato plant soup was accompanied by rice filled with silt and worms. The prisoners would joke to each other that the worms were the real food as they were the most protein-rich ingredient of the meal. Other survivors mentioned that they were forced to drink seawater or contaminated water. Experts agree that the whole meal for one person in the hell ship was less than 700 calories a day. That was borderline necessary to keep most prisoners alive. Japan had a severe need for laborers, otherwise these prisoners would have been put to death right after the surrender. In conditions where diseases were running amok, the falling sick would be punished by having that prisoner's rations cut by one-third. Now, Despite that, Allied prisoners would rather give up their food and then distribute it evenly amongst themselves. The Japanese would keep extensive logs about how much food was required to keep the prisoners alive and how they could subsidize food without hurting the labor output of the prisoners. Look down, you could see the POWs all against the bulkhead. I noticed that the Japanese guard down there was bare to the waist. That is, cap on, he had a shovel. And you know, as these fellows would step off down there, he'd swing the shovel at them and point somewhere. And I. Uh, I figured I don't want to get hit by that shovel. With the night being so cramped, that meant there was no way to use the bucket for nature's calls, so it was common to just let it happen in whatever position they were. Even on the docks, the Japanese guards would not often let them move and often force them to empty their bowels standing. Wherever the ships would dock or when they reached Japan, these prisoners had to do the harshest labor manually with the most basic tools such as picks, shovels, hand axes, and hand saws. A delay in compliance could have the prisoners put to death. Even on the hell ships, no matter how sick or famished the prisoners would be, they had to climb up on the docks when the roll call would be called. Compliance failure would have the guards eliminate those who would be on the docks, leaving the prisoners with guilt and bitterness. A Tale of Two Ships It's believed that one-third or 70 to 80,000 prisoners that were transported on these merchant ships didn't make it due to suffocation, starvation, or sickness, and more went insane. Those who went mad also involuntarily or in a rage caused hundreds of more deaths. Some sources put the number of POWs on these ships to nearly double the figures, somewhere around 126,000. 
these ships were part of a sick game that the Japanese had invented that was a blatant violation of the Geneva Convention. The Japanese army didn't brand these merchant ships with the Red Cross to indicate that these ships were carrying prisoners of war and not cargo and not supplies for the war effort. A lot of such ships came under tax by the American Navy. More than 20,000 Allied and Asian prisoners perished in such friendly fire. In October 1944, a ship called Arisan Maru was torpedoed east of Hong Kong by an American submarine called Snooker Shark. There were 1,800 POWs on the Arisan Maru and only eight survived the sinking in Arisan Maru, and five of them washed up on the shores of mainland China. Another ship, Orioko Maru, was bombarded by American aircraft in December 1944 off the Bataan Peninsula of the Philippines. There were 1,600 American POWs on the ship and 1,340 survived. However, surviving Orioku Maru was like jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. Japanese guards reassembled the survivors at San Fernando La Union, Philippines, and put them aboard two more hell ships to resume their journey to Japan. All of a sudden, you heard the scrambling up on deck, and then the, any aircraft gun start up. The plane had already come down, dropped the bombs, and one went off and blew all the timbers and things down on where we were, and something just knocked the hell out of me. Nearly 1,100 were forced onto the Yonora Maru, while the remaining 240 were conscripted on the Brazil Maru. The last trip of the Yonora Maru was to transport horses. The prisoners forced to board it found their holes decorated with rotten horse manure. As most prisoners had not eaten since the sinking of the Oriuku Maru, they were desperate and picked whatever filth was on the ground to get rid of their starvation. The lack of proper food and water and widespread contamination caused the rampant spread of diseases in the cramped cages. The guards ignored and mocked the plight of the ill and dined prisoners with insults. Lisbon Maru was carrying 2,000 British POWs from Hong Kong to Japan in appalling conditions when torpedoed by the USS Grouper on October 1, 1942. 800 POWs died when the ship sank the following day. Many were put to death by the ship's Japanese guards. The Japanese partied and celebrated while the prisoners watched them from their cages with little food or water. 34 of the prisoners from Inora Maru and 10 of the Brazil Maru's prisoners passed away by January 6th. But that was only a slow, agonizing buildup to the devastating finale. On January 9th, 1945, General MacArthur and Admiral Halsey's air squadrons carried out an attack on the Takao Harbor from the USS Hornet. Both ships were targeted by the U.S. fighter planes along with 23 other ships on the harbor. If only they had known who was on board those ships. Inora Maru went down with a large number of prisoners who couldn't escape their fate. The number of POW casualties remains undetermined until now. The surviving POWs found by the U.S. Army looked like they had been through the depths of the abyss, broken, shell-shocked, emaciated, and some were even missing eyes, teeth, or limbs. As it took American forces a couple of days to capture the harbor after the air raid of January 9th, the sufferings of the surviving POWs were greatly aggravated by the fact that Japanese soldiers and medics went out of their way to ignore the plight of these poor souls. The Case of Mistaken Identity one of the soldiers taken prisoner after the American surrender at the Battle of Bataan was Army Sergeant Joe Cayoumia. I sure hope I said that right. Cayoumia was part of New Mexico's 200th Coast Artillery Unit, and he was ethnically a Diné or Navajo, but given his name and his appearance, the Japanese assumed that he was a Japanese American and they didn't believe his Native American heritage for months. Sadly, lots of these Japanese soldiers had only interacted with Caucasian Americans and African Americans very seldom. The Japanese were targeting anyone who were American sympathizers. But then it dawned on the Japanese guards who were trying to decipher the American code of communication over long-distance radio. They realized the language Kayoumiya spoke other than English sounded a lot like the language used for long-distance communication by the U.S. Army. They weren't wrong as the U.S. Army was using the Navajo language as one of the ways to encrypt their long-distance messaging. First, Kayoumiya was sent to Camp O'Donnell, which meant he had to do the Bataan Death March along with 70,000 other prisoners. The Japanese guards put him through hell, but would keep him alive for his knowledge of the Navajo language. Yes, the U.S. Marine Corps were using a Navajo language to communicate, but even that code was encrypted further by using an encryption system. So even if somebody knew the language, the message would sound like utter nonsense to them as it did to Kayoumiya. Only those who were trained for months could decipher the code. He was then put on one of the Hell ships to be transferred to Japan in the hopes that the army there could make him decipher the code for them. The gloomy and nerve-wracking conditions at the Hell ships pushed Kayoumiya towards melancholy, and the man tried to starve himself to death. When the guards realized what he was trying to do, they punished him until they could force him to eat. As punishment, they made him stand for hours in deep snow hoping he would eventually cooperate. When that led to nowhere, they told him that he could come back inside to his cell. There was just one little thing to make matters worse. The prison Kayoumiya was housed at was just outside a city called Nagasaki. However, thanks to the concrete walls of his cell, 
Kayo Umiya survived the atomic blast and was let go by a Japanese officer three days after the blast. There is a happy ending to this story at least. Kayo Umiya made his way back home and lived a long and possibly happier life until the age of 77. After Nagasaki, Japan surrendered and some of the villains who were responsible for all the atrocities committed by Japan were tried for their crimes. Lieutenant General Hama Masaharu was charged for the sad events that took place at the Bataan Death March and Hell Ships. Hama accepted the charges for ordering the offense and the evacuation of POWs. He also took responsibility for the actions of his men who committed these war crimes, but he denied ordering such cruel and inhumane practices or having any knowledge about them. The tribunal, however, still found him guilty on all counts and a firing squad was assigned to carry out his death sentence in the Philippines. Thanks for watching Nutty History. We would appreciate it if you would like and share the video with those who might be interested in Japanese American history. Also, click the subscribe button and the bell to watch more videos about nutty stories of human history.